League of the Living Dead by Randall Garrett, first published in Mystic, number one, November 1953. Barbara had been dead for seven months when Martin saw her in the little club on 42nd Street. He was on his seventh double bourbon and water, and his eyesight, poor as it was, was considerably better than his critical judgment. He squinted his eyes to get a better look. She was toying with a half-empty glass and staring in rapturous concentration at the six-piece combo which was permitting its drummer the ecstasy of a rhythmic grand mal seizure. Across from her sat two men. The one on the outside was tall and saturnine, the other somewhat shorter and wider across the shoulders. Martin was immediately stabbed with twinges of jealousy. The fact that his wife couldn't possibly be there meant little to him at the moment. The fact that she was there with somebody else did mean a great deal. He decided he had to have a closer look. He poured the remainder of drink number seven down his throat and made his way toward the bar. On the way, he would have to pass the booth where she sat. By the time he had arrived at the booth in question, his resolve to go to the bar had dissolved into the vague mists of some ethanolic limbo. There was no longer any doubt in his mind that the woman before him was Barbara. The hair in the page boy bob, the crystalline blue of her eyes, the smooth, almost perfectly hemispherical curve of her breasts, the tilt of her brows, every inch of her was Barbara. A man doesn't live with a woman for eight years and not know her, not even when he's boiled to the ears. None of the trio at the booth noticed him at first. Martin was a six foot 200 pounder who filled a tux nicely and could quite obviously handle himself in an emergency, but the dance had just ended and the people milling around him as they came from the floor were doing a pretty fair job of camouflaging him. The little group didn't see him at all until he placed his hands carefully on the edge of the table, leaned over and said, honey, what in hell are you doing here? It was an inane thing to say. It wasn't the thing you really ought to say to a woman you know is dead. But somehow, Martin couldn't think of anything else to say. She turned those blue eyes on him with a look that carried no sign of recognition. She said, I beg your pardon, I don't think. Martin just stood there, weaving and baffled, as the whole enormous insanity of the situation flooded over him. The last hastily down drink began to hit him, and his sight spun kaleidoscopically. The girl's voice said, Gregor, he's sick. Call a waiter or something. Who is he? Never mind, said the taller of the two men. I'll help him. Come along, friend. Here, chum, came the other man's voice. Have a drink. Give him mine, said the girl. Then get him in a cab. Dimly, Martin felt a glass being pressed into his hand, and he hastily emptied the contents into his stomach. Then the world went away on a blue-gray fog. When he woke up the next morning, he was in his own bed, fully dressed except for his shoes and coat. He felt exactly as he deserved to feel. A double bromo, a half pint of tomato juice, two cups of coffee, and three cigarettes later, he felt well enough to get into the shower without having to sit down. All the time, his mind was boiling. Had it been Barbara or hadn't it? Logically, it couldn't be. Barbara was dead. He had been with her the night she died and he had held her hand, crying, until it was as cool as the chill atmosphere of death itself. Martin toweled himself until his skin tingled and walked back into the bedroom. That was when he saw the old-fashioned glass sitting on his dresser. He knew instantly that it was the glass Barbara had been drinking out of the night before. He'd emptied it and put it in his pocket. He looked at it without touching it, trying to get the light just right. Sure enough, there were smudges on it, Impossible to tell whose, though, but he knew how to find out. He picked up the phone and dialed. When the police switchboard answered, he said, James Martin here. Give me Lieutenant Donovan, homicide. He waited a moment. Hello, Donnie. Jim, look, can you get out for a cup of coffee? I don't know how important it is yet. Okay, the usual place in half an hour. He hung up and began to dress. Donovan was already waiting for him in the child's restaurant just off Times Square. He sat down in the booth and said, Donovan, you know me, don't you? The little detective looked at him over his coffee cup. Well, the face is familiar. Anyway, you know what I mean. As a lawyer, I've always played it square with the cops and with you especially. 
I want to ask you a favor, unofficially, and I want your word that you won't say anything about it. Donovan peered at him from slate gray eyes. Marty, you know I'd probably cut my own throat for you, but not without a reason. Martin looked at him for a moment, then here's the reason. His right hand reached into his coat pocket and brought out the old-fashioned glass. So, Donovan raised his eyebrows. Martin leaned forward earnestly. Donnie, all I want is for you to identify any latent prints on that glass and tell me whose they are and don't tell anyone else. Donovan ran his tongue around the inside of his cheek. Mind if I ask why? Whose do you figure they are? Martin leaned back. If I told you, you'd think I was nuts. If it is who I think, you'll know the answer as well as I. He looked at his watch. Look, Donnie, I haven't been to the office yet this morning, and I've got work to do. Can you phone me there? Sure. Martin picked up the check and made his way toward the cashier. Two hours later, his phone rang. He picked up the receiver. Martin speaking. Look here, Marty. Donovan's voice came sharply over the instrument. If this is a joke, I don't think it's funny. And if it isn't, I want an explanation. Martin felt something cold and paralyzing inside his brain. He knew very well what Donovan was going to say, even before he asked. What do you mean, Donnie? I mean this glass you gave me. What are Barbara's prints doing all over it? The resistance to intense shock that had made James Martin the brilliant trial lawyer that he was came back in that instant. Calmly, he told Donovan everything he could remember about the night before. There was a long pause on the phone then. Is that the straight dope, Marty? That's the straight dope. Another long pause. Marty, we're taking some time off. Remember that little place in Greenwich Village we used to go to when we were in school? Meet me there in half an hour. But Donnie, I, he stopped. The phone was dead. When Donovan talked that way, he meant it. Martin grabbed his hat, took the elevator down, and flagged a taxi. During the ride, he tried to keep his mind focused, but it kept swirling around in unreal circles, confusing him. At the destination, he almost forgot to tip the cabbie, a thing he invariably did. He pushed open the door of the bar and saw the little policeman waggling a finger from one of the rear booths. He walked back and sat down. Donnie, what? Don't say anything until you've finished your drink, and then let me do the talking, Donovan said with peculiar Irish logic. Martin swallowed the bourbon that Donovan had waiting for him, then looked at the detective expectantly. Donovan stared at his fingernails as though he were undecided about where to start. Finally, he looked up. Marty, there's something screwy here. We both know Babs is dead, and yet I know you well enough to take your word about what happened last night. But as a police officer, I can't touch it. I don't have enough to go on. The prints? Obviously faked. I can't start anything on evidence like that. And somehow, he paused, groping for words. Somehow, I don't think we want a police investigation. Martin didn't say anything. He didn't even feel anything except the peculiar numbness of an unreal situation. Donovan rubbed his chin nervously. You've got the money for a private investigator, haven't you? Well, I know just the man for you. Come along. Donovan rose and Martin followed him out the door to the street. They walked several blocks, turning a couple of times, and Donovan finally pulled to a halt in front of the entrance to a small office building. He led the way up a flight of stairs down a hall to the door of a small office. The lettering on the door said, Sean O'Brien, private investigator. Come in. Following the sign's advice, they stepped into the outer office, an office which was not furnished in accordance with the shabby genteel flavor of the rest of the building. The walls were paneled in fine oak and three tastefully chosen watercolors decorated them. The furniture was modern and expensive. The wall-to-wall -wall rug was thick and luxurious. And the lovely girl with the soft brown hair who was smiling at them from behind the reception desk completed the picture. Good afternoon, Lieutenant, she said in a voice that sounded like the ripple of water over the lakes of Killarney. How are you, Miss McElhiney? Is Sean in? He's busy right now but he'll be ready in a few minutes. Fine, Donovan turned back to Martin. Look, Marty, this is entirely out of my jurisdiction. I don't want to be told anything unless Sean himself tells me. Trust Sean, he knows his business and he's a fine man. Tell him everything you told me and answer all his questions. 
He chewed at his lip for a moment, then went on. You're not going to like what you find, I think, but you've got the guts to take it. Then he turned to the girl. Miss McElhiney, you can tell Sean that James Martin is a man he can trust with his life. With that, he stepped out the door, closing it behind him. Martin blinked. Somehow, things seemed to be happening too fast for him. What was all this incredible nonsense? Vaguely, he heard the girl's voice talking over the inter-office phone. Then he realized she was talking to him. He wrenched his mind back into the room. I beg your pardon. I said, she smiled, that Mr. O'Brien will see you now. The inner office was similar to the outer in style. Along one wall ran a monstrous bookcase filled with books of every description. It looked as though Sean O'Brien had made a point of collecting a representative sample of every type of book published since Gutenberg. O'Brien himself was a tall, muscular young man with light brown hair and deep-set blue eyes. He waved to a leather upholstered chair before the desk. Sit down, Mr. Martin. Martin sat, not quite knowing how to begin telling his reason for being there. It suddenly occurred to him that he really wasn't quite sure why he was there. O'Brien seemed to sense Martin's fuzzy state of mind. Mr. Martin, before you begin, let me ask you a question. Do you believe in the supernatural? Martin shook his head wordlessly. Neither do I. There is no such thing. Everything in this universe operates according to the natural laws of this universe. We may not know all those laws, but they exist nevertheless. Now, Donovan wouldn't have brought you here unless there was something definitely queer about your case. Something that seems supernatural. I don't handle any other kind of case. So, regardless of how silly it may sound, we'll listen to what you have to say without calling for the nearest psychiatrist. Okay? Something clicked in Martin's brain, and the fog that had seemed to cover it vanished, washed away by the matter-of-fact attitude of Sean O'Brien's speech. Martin relaxed. Okay, here it is. Last night I was in. Martin went over the whole thing again, trying to remember as best he could exactly what had happened. As he did, Sean O'Brien's eyes began to narrow, and a deep inner excitement began to light them. When Martin had finished, O'Brien said, About that glass, did the girl hand it to you? Uh, no, the man, I think, the tall one. Hmm. Sean seemed to find a great significance in that statement. He flipped the intercom switch. Alice, see if you can get hold of Lieutenant Donovan. He ought to be back at headquarters by now. After a minute or two, the girl's voice said, He's on the line, Sean. O'Brien picked up the receiver. Donnie, Sean, look, that glass Martin brought you. Any prints on it besides the girls? None but Martin's. I thought so. Look, isn't it queer that a wet whiskey glass should pick up prints? Okay, thanks, Donnie. I'll let you know. He hung up and looked back at Martin. Martin, doesn't it strike you as odd that your wife, if it was your wife, should be drinking a warm, old-fashioned? Warm? I don't remember. I was too drunk to remember the taste. What makes you think it was warm? Simple. A cold drink condenses moisture from the air. A wet glass doesn't pick up fingerprints too well, if at all. This glass had good, clean prints on it. QED. This glass wasn't cold. Did your wife like warm liquor? Good Lord, no, it made her sick. But what? I'm going to make a broad guess. Your wife died of an odd form of anemia. For no known reason, the hemoglobin in her blood cells dropped drastically. The white count remained the same. The red count dropped a little, but not enough to be serious. It was the lack of hemoglobin that killed her. Right? If Martin had been the type to look flabbergasted, he would have done so right there and then. Instead, he nodded. That's about what the doctor said. How did you know? I didn't know. I told you I was just guessing. Where was your wife buried? Martin named the cemetery, and the detective wrote it down on a piece of paper. All right, Mr. Martin, we'll do what we can. I'll let you know if we find anything. Is there anything I can do? Sean looked at him sharply. Yes, there is, if you don't mind going through with it. Anything. This is beginning to get under my skin. All right. I want you to go back to that bar tonight. Keep your eyes open. If you see anything or anyone suspicious, strike up a conversation. Don't let them know you suspect anything wrong. And above all, don't give them your name. Think up a good phony. I want you to see if you can find out who they are and where they live. But for heaven's sake, don't make them suspicious. Martin grinned. I haven't been a lawyer all these years for nothing. I'll let you know what I find. 
Fine, I'll work on my end of it. Somehow, the street looked unnaturally bright when Martin stepped out into it. After the cool, indirect lighting of Sean O'Brien's office, the afternoon sun was hot and harsh. Nerves, he thought. My nerves are a little shaky. He hailed a taxi, gave the cabbie his address, and sat back in the seat, closing his eyes. When he unlocked his apartment, the first thing he did was mix himself a scotch and water. That, he figured, would help him relax. He figured wrong. He couldn't seem to settle down. He paced the floor and smoked cigarettes as though he were an expectant father. The whole thing was senseless. Babs was dead, he knew that, but he felt he had to keep telling himself or he'd forget it. By 8.30, he was paying off a cab driver in front of the club where he had seen Barbara the night before. It gave him a slight case of the creeps to think that he might actually find her here again. He checked his hat and picked out a table in the corner where he could command a view of the whole room. He ordered a drink, but it was beginning to get warm before he took more than a swallow or two. It was not until well after nine that he noticed that there was another person in the bar who also seemed to be watching for someone. He was a swarthy, astonishingly thin man of a little below average height with dark eyes and a face that looked as though it were made of old and well-used Cordovan leather. Martin noticed him because the drink which the waiter had placed on the table before the dark-skinned man had not been touched. And the leather-faced one was also surveying the room. There was nothing particularly abnormal about him. After all, lots of people come into bars to wait for someone else. But the thing that drew Martin's attention was the pills. Every so often, the dark-faced man would take a small bottle from his pocket, shake a small green pill into his hand, and swallow it without using any liquid to wash it down. The man looked as though Martin caught something out of the corner of his eye, and his head jerked in the direction of the door, as though he had been jabbed by a bayonet. His heart jumped. It was Barbara. She was alone this time. Martin watched her quietly, forcing his nerves to steadiness. She didn't look around. She simply stepped over to the bar and ordered an old-fashioned. Without the ice, finally Martin made up his mind. He finished his drink and walked over to the bar. He pretended not to notice her at first. He ordered another drink. After a moment or two, he saw her face in the mirror. She was watching him. James Martin was a criminal lawyer with a brilliant record in the courtroom. In other words, he was an actor who did his best work under strain. He turned to her, smiling. Hello, I thought you looked familiar, he said smoothly. I want to apologize for my behavior last night. She returned the smile. It was nothing, really. You seemed to think I was someone you knew. Her look was suddenly calculating and watchful. Did I? He looked innocent. I must really have been boiled. I don't think anyone else could look like you. Her face softened, thank you. May I buy you a drink? Why, yes, thanks. After the drinks were ordered, she looked up at him coyly. Let's go over to the table. I don't like to talk at a bar. He followed her over and pulled out her chair for her. The perfect gentleman, he thought. So far, he was doing fine, but he hadn't learned anything. If this woman was Barbara, she was doing a better job of acting than he'd thought Barbara capable of. He hoped for a while that she'd quit acting when they were alone at the table. He kept throwing her the straight lines to some of the pet jokes he and Barbara had had together. It didn't work. She missed every one of them. Martin was so intent on his character analysis that it took him the better part of two hours to realize that her conversation did have one definite goal. The spark was missing from her small talk. There was none of Barbara's usual wit and brilliance. This Louise, as she called herself, simply didn't have any originality in her thinking. But, in spite of all that, he could see where she was leading. She was about as subtle as a train wreck. He couldn't help himself. The girl had none of Barbara's brains, but she did have Barbara's body, or a reasonable facsimile thereof. And the scotch helped, too. It was well after four in the morning when he woke up in the hotel room. His head ached and his tongue felt fuzzy, and it took him a few seconds to realize what had awakened him. The door had closed. He looked around. The girl was gone. 
In spite of his head, he jumped up and grabbed his pants. The wallet was still there, undisturbed. He dressed quickly, eased the door open, and looked down the hall toward the elevator. The door was just sliding shut. Martin ran toward the stairway and went down them at a rate that would have broken his neck with one misstep. The girl was just going out the lobby door when Martin reached the lobby. There had been two things in his favor. She had had to wait for the elevator, and there were only three flights of stairs to run down. He followed her to the street at a more leisurely pace. The street was pretty well deserted at that hour, and he didn't want to attract attention. He didn't notice the car pull up to the curb behind him. In fact, he had no idea that there was anyone around but the girl until something slammed hard against the side of his head. What shall we do with him? said a voice. Seal him up until he dies, then he can join us, said another. We must hurry then, it is late, soon the sun will be up. Martin heard the words vaguely and tried to say something, but all he could get out was a groan. When he did, somebody kicked him in the head again and he went back to sleep. The next time he woke up, there was a light shining in his eyes and a face looming over him. He tried to focus his eyes, but the pain in his head rose to a crescendo and he had to close his eyes. It's about time you came around. How do you feel? Oh, lousy. Martin opened his eyes again and looked at the face. It was familiar, but he didn't quite place it at first. Then it hit him. The face belonged to the little leathery-faced man who had been taking the green pills in the bar. Sit up, the little man said, and take these. His hand held three white tablets. What are they? 50 milligrams of thiamine and two aspirins. He took them and washed them down with water from the glass the little man handed him. As the pain began to subside, Martin began to take in his surroundings. He was lying on a slab of marble in a large room. Around the walls of the room were a series of panels, about two and a half feet square. He recognized where he was. It was a morgue. Each of the panels concealed a drawer within which, presumably, there lay a body. He looked at the little brown man. Who the devil are you? And where are we? And why did you slug me? Didn't slug you. Here. He pulled out a billfold and spread it open. The card within said, I Brim Grom Special Investigator Sean O'Brien Agency. Grom popped a green pill into his mouth and continued. You're in a morgue. I followed you when you left the bar with the girl. Followed you out of the hotel. Knew she'd leave before dawn. Saw you get slugged. Followed their car here. Managed to sneak in when they brought you here. Can't get out now, time lock. The man talked like a Western Union message. What do you mean, time lock? Martin asked confusedly. Ibram Grom waved toward the massive door of the vault. On the door. Won't open until after sundown. They're getting smart. Who's getting smart? Grom's gesture took in the occupants of the morgue. Them. Even got time locks on most of the drawers. Clever. He glanced at his watch. You've been out 16 hours. Mostly whiskey. Almost sundown again now. We better hide. Martin didn't feel up to arguing. Grom opened one of the doors along the wall just above eye level. They put you in here, said Grom. Get back in. If they look inside, play dead. I'll leave door open a crack. That way you can see. Don't give yourself away. They'll kill you. Martin climbed inside and lay down. His head turned so that he could see through the crack in the door. The brown-faced detective climbed up to another tier opened a cubicle and concealed himself. It seemed like an eternity before anything happened. Martin's head had almost quit hurting and he was getting restless. Then there was a sudden chorus of clicks. The time locks had opened. Somewhere, deep inside him, Martin knew what he was going to see, but on the surface of his mind was a block that refused to let the full realization come. There was a scrabbling sound, something like rats in the walls. Suddenly, one of the doors popped open. Martin watched in horror as first a hand, then a head, appeared from the interior of the coffin. It was a very old man. As he climbed out, Martin could see that he was naked. Come out, brothers, it is time, the old man's voice sounded hoarsely. The others began to push themselves out of the coffin drawers. Martin felt the back of his neck tingle coldly as the center of the room began to fill with things. He couldn't think of them as human. Barbara was there, but he no longer thought of her as human either. Not since last night. 
He also recognized the two men Barbara had been with the first night he had seen her. The dried and withered old man began to speak. We have work to do, brothers. Bring out the new one. Two of the others opened one of the doors and slid the slab out. The cadaver which lay upon it was a blonde woman in her middle thirties. Her eyes were half open and filmed. She was very obviously dead. The rest stood around her in a circle and held hands, and then two of them grabbed the blonde woman's hands, completing the circle. The old man cut the lights, and the room was plunged into darkness. There was nothing to see at first, but gradually a blue glow appeared. It seemed to come from the blonde woman's body. Slowly it brightened until the whole room was filled with the weird blue light. Then, quite suddenly, the glow faded, seeming to sink into the woman's body. There was silence for a moment, then the lights went on. The blonde was sitting up on the table. Everything seemed to go hazy for Martin after that. He was vaguely aware that the things were dressing and leaving one by one. He had sense enough to close his eyes when the old man opened the door to the cubicle he was in, but he only partially heard the comment about his dying soon. For the fourth time in 24 hours, he passed out cold. This time when he woke up, it was Sean O'Brien's face he saw. He felt a great deal better than he had the last time he'd come out of it. Woo, he said, did I have a screwy dream? And then he knew it hadn't been a dream. Where are you? Finished O'Brien. You're in my apartment. You'd better snap out of it, Martin. You've spent most of the time asleep. Not that I blame you. After two clouts on the head and the shock of what you saw, plus too much scotch, you've got a perfect right to pass out. But you'd better get a grip on yourself. I feel okay. Oddly enough, except for a tender spot behind his right ear, he did feel okay. I had a doctor in here to look you over, Sean explained. He gave you a glucose injection. You hadn't eaten all day. Martin sat up on the bed. Ibram Grom was seated across the room, putting a green pill in his mouth. Chlorophyll, he explained. Halitosis, you know. Sean handed Martin two sandwiches and a glass of milk, and Martin realized suddenly that he was starving. As he wolfed them down, the Irishman began to explain. I've been after this bunch for over a year now, but I didn't know any way to lay my hands on them. Stupid as they are, in some ways, they're pretty clever at hiding out. But what in heaven's name are they? Martin asked. Vampires, or at least, Sean corrected himself, the basis for the vampire legend. Of course, in the passage of time, the legend has become so loaded with superstitious nonsense that 90% of it is false. The old legend claims that a vampire is one of the undead who can, at will, change itself into a bat-like form and fly. It attacks the living by sucking the blood, and in the process, the victim becomes another vampire. If that were really the case, vampires would have overrun the earth long ago. They would multiply by geometrical progression. One becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and so on. Obviously, this hasn't taken place. Why? He paused, but the question was rhetorical. He took a drag off his cigarette and went on. The vampire, per se, is what might be called an electronic virus, a web of semi-intelligent electrical force, an energy disease. It has no sex. You notice the way those things call each other brother, whether the body they happen to inhabit was male or female. The method of reproduction is similar to that of a colony of bacteria. Given a suitable medium, it can reproduce and grow. In this case, the medium happens to be a freshly dead human being. Not just any corpse either. It has to be prepared by a partial invasion before death. Most people are immune to the disease. You are, for instance, or I wouldn't have sent you after your... After the girl. The result's the same as that from radioactive poisoning, though the physiology of the disease is a bit different. But when the body dies, the pre-invasion virus dies too, making it necessary for the cadaver to be re-impregnated after death. Martin lit a cigarette with hands that were still shaking a little. He looked up at Sean when he had it going and asked, how come this disease hasn't spread fast enough to attract attention? Sean frowned. Well, as I said, most people are immune, and it requires intimate contact with a dead carrier to get it even if you are susceptible. Martin closed his eyes and shuddered. O'Brien went on. Just exactly how they managed to manipulate the body after death, I don't know. There are certain definite changes in the metabolism. 
The sebaceous glands of the skin dry up, for instance. Remember that glass? The woman's fingerprints were on it, but the man's weren't. He'd been dead too long. What about the warm liquor? Martin wanted to know. They can't stand extreme cold, and to them, extreme means anything below about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Another thing they can't stand is ultraviolet radiation. It disrupts their electronic coordination and puts them into a coma. That partially accounts for their purely nocturnal activity. Martin shook his head. After this, you'll have me believing in werewolves, ghouls, ghosts, leprechauns, trolls, bogeymen, and things that go boomp in the night. I thought vampires were a species of bat. Sean grinned. I always wondered how the bat business got into the vampire legend myself, until I found that the order Choroptera is the only animal besides man which is susceptible to the disease. In fact, it is even more successful with the bat because the death of the bat doesn't kill the vampire virus and there's no need for a secondary infection. As for the rest of those things, the answer is that most of them do exist. There's nothing odd about a single-celled animal like the amoeba changing its shape, is there? Then why couldn't a many-celled animal do it? Werewolves do. There are plenty of animals with specialized diets. The koala eats only eucalyptus leaves. What's the matter with a ghoul having a specialized diet? Ghosts? Simply another form of the electronic life that the vampire is composed of, except that they are more intelligent and don't require a host. Martin frowned. What do you mean, more intelligent than a vampire? Seems to me they're pretty smart. O'Brien shook his head. Their intelligence is very limited. It is dependent upon the brain configuration of the body it is inhabiting which is why they prefer human bodies to bat bodies. But even with a human brain to work with, they have almost no imagination. Their inventive and reasoning abilities are practically nil. Ibrim Grome glanced at his watch, compared it carefully with the clock on the wall, and said, dawn in three hours. Martin blinked. Good Lord, what day is this? Sean O'Brien stood up. Thursday morning. You haven't been out long. As soon as the vampire horde left, he dragged you out of there and brought you here. Martin glanced at the emaciated-looking Grome. He hardly looked big enough to lift 200 pounds of dead weight. Must be one of those wiry, muscled characters. Out of there, where were we? As I said, Sean explained, I've known for some months that these things have been active in the New York area. Now, embalming ruins a body and cremation destroys it. Therefore, in order to propagate, the vampire must have control over the disposal of bodies after death and before embalming occurs. Obviously, that means a funeral home. The trouble was, I didn't know which home until you came to me. Then it was easy. I simply checked to see which one had taken care of your wife. I found that you, among several hundred others, had taken out burial policies with this place, Kimberly's. Time to go, said Grom. Yeah, Sean put on his coat. Martin stood up from the bed. I'm going too, he announced. Sean and Ibrim looked at each other for a second. Then Sean said, come ahead then. Ten minutes later, they were in O'Brien's car, heading for Brooklyn. Martin, in the back seat, took a drag off his cigarette, inhaled deeply, and said, I'll be afraid to go out after dark from now on. I'll never know when some werewolf or ghoul is going to jump me. Nuts, snorted Grome. It doesn't work that way, Martin, said O'Brien. A werewolf is as human as you or I, or nearly so. He can change his body a little, as far as the skeletal structure will permit. But that doesn't make a killer out of him. There are a good many werewolves who don't even know they're any different from anyone else. They don't change to wolves, you know, their bones aren't plastic. Hundreds of years ago, a few of them would make themselves look hideous to frighten the local natives in order to gain power. The religion of ancient Egypt was started by just such a group. That's where the Egyptians got those gods with the animal heads. But today, most of them are just as law-abiding as you or I. I'll admit they'd have a better chance to get away with it. But unless you get one sore at you, you're not likely to get killed by a werewolf. The chances are just as good that some human will do you in. And as for ghouls, you have absolutely nothing to worry about on that score. They are a branch of genus Homo that split off from the mainstream of humanity several hundred thousand years ago and became carrion feeders. They're related to Homo sapiens in the same way that the vulture is related to the eagle.
Homo necrophagus would be the scientific name. They don't bother living people at all. Why should they? Their digestive systems require that the flesh be dead for a good long time. Fresh meat is as inedible to them as rubber is to you. It's much easier to buy steak at the butcher shop and let it lay around for a few weeks than it is to go prowling through cemeteries at night. Besides, embalming ruins a body. Do you like formaldehyde in your filet mignon? Oh, they'd eat human flesh, all right, if it were available. But when you come right down to it, what's wrong with that? They aren't strictly human, so it isn't cannibalism. And besides, what good is your body to you after you're dead? You don't consider maggots, saprophytic fungi, hyenas, vultures, and other such scavengers who keep the earth clean to be evil villains, do you? Then why worry about ghouls? Martin thought it over in silence. Put like that, it sounded logical. All right. And he could see why such people would keep themselves hidden from the rest of humanity. Human beings en masse were still savages. The minorities, ghouls et al., would be wiped out by Homo sapiens quickly. If human beings found such slight differences as color and religious beliefs enough excuse for violent persecution, what would they do to a different species of the same genus? The car was speeding across the Brooklyn Bridge, weaving through the light traffic under Sean O'Brien's cool guidance. It took them nearly 10 more minutes to get to their destination. The Kimberly Funeral Home was a big modernistic structure which covered two city blocks. Sean wheeled the car on past it and pulled up on the other side of the street, nearly half a block away. Then he turned and pointed out the back window. See that building behind the main structure? The one with no windows. That's where you and I, Brim, spent the day yesterday. The vampires will be back before dawn, and it will be the only time we can get at them. The only way we could get through the time locks in the daytime would be with dynamite, and I don't think the Brooklyn police would approve of it. But the door will be open for a little while just before the sun comes up in order to let the horde in. That's when we'll hit them. Suddenly, Ibrim Grom's face appeared in the window. We're all set, Ibrim. We've got the place boxed. Martin jerked his head around. Ibrim Grom was still in the front seat. He looked back at the man in the window and realized that the faint glow of light from the street lamps had led him astray. Although the man had the same dark, leathery face and the same smoky black eyes, he could see that it was not exactly the same face. Another similar face appeared behind the first. Are we ready to go, Sean? Ready, said Sean. Come on, Martin. They all piled out of the car, and Martin followed Sean and the others toward the mortuary. As they neared it, Martin could see other figures, thin, lean, and brown, converging on the building in the pre-dawn darkness. Martin, whispered Sean, climb up that fire escape. He indicated a steel stairway going up the side of the main building. From the landing up there, you'll be able to see the surrounding area. If there's any trouble, blow this. He handed Martin a small whistle. Martin recognized it as one of those supersonic dog whistles, which were inaudible to the human ear. Evidently, the Irishman had some sort of instrument to detect its noise. Martin did as he was bid. When he got to the upper landing of the fire escape, he found that he could see the street and the morgue building behind equally well. The door of the morgue was open, and Martin could see one of the vampires sitting inside. He recognized him as one of the men with whom Barbara had been sitting that first night in the bar, the one she had addressed as Gregor. The vampire was evidently acting as a lookout and guard. For several minutes, nothing happened. Then, without warning, two figures converged on Gregor from the blackness outside the lighted area. There was a short scuffle, and then the two little brown men dragged Gregor out into the darkness. Martin had seen that one of the little men was carrying an ultraviolet lamp. Evidently, it had put the vampire into a coma. Martin could see almost nothing outside the illuminated area around the open morgue door, so for a while he couldn't be sure of what was going on. Then, astonishingly, Gregor walked back into the morgue and took his seat as though nothing had happened. Martin almost blew the whistle before he realized that the detective and his men must have everything under control or they would have warned him by this time. Again, Martin waited casting an occasional glance toward the street to make sure nothing was happening out there. 
Then the vampires began to return. In groups of two or three, they came out of the darkness, spoke in hushed tones to the guarding Gregor, and climbed into their coffins. Martin turned his head toward the street, and he could see several of them walking toward the mortuary. They probably took taxis to some spot a block or two from the place and walked the rest of the way so that they wouldn't attract attention. Barbara was one of the last to arrive. She was wearing an evening gown that showed off her curves to perfection. Martin shuddered again. Finally, the last of the horrors had come home. Martin began to worry. Gregor's job, presumably, was to set the time lock on the doors after all the vampires were asleep and then climb into his own drawer. If Sean and his men didn't attack pretty soon, but Gregor didn't set the time lock. He didn't even close the morgue door. Instead, he stepped outside and waved his hand. It was getting lighter now, and Martin could see that there were several dozen of the little men who looked so much like Ibrim Grom running toward the building. Gregor let them all into the morgue, closed the door behind them, and walked away, leaving Grom and his friends in sole possession of the building. A minute or so later, Martin heard Sean's voice calling from the foot of the fire escape. Martin, his voice was soft but imperative. Get down here fast. The sun will be up pretty soon. Martin clambered down the fire escape, and he and the detective sprinted toward the car. They got inside, but Sean didn't start the machine immediately. He stuck a cigarette in his mouth and handed one to Martin, who lit it with shaking hands. Is it all over? He asked the Irishman. Just about. What did they do? Martin asked dully. Drive stakes through their hearts? He didn't like the idea of Barbara being mutilated like that. No, said Sean. That's another part of the medieval superstition. Vampirism is like hog cholera or hoof and mouth disease. You have to destroy the carrier. Burn them? No, look at it this way. Every life form has its natural enemies. The vampire is a dead thing that preys on the living. Its natural enemies are living things that prey on the dead. Ibram Grom and his boys aren't human, they're ghouls. Martin was quite suddenly sick. When he could get his breath again, he said, What? What about Gregor, the guard? Why did you let him get away? Gregor? He didn't get away. That wasn't him who let the boys in. It was me. Sean's voice was soft. You see, Martin, I'm a werewolf.